When Freeman Dyson formally described his concept of Dyson structures, deemed later as Dyson spheres, he was intentionally vague in defining it, simply calling it a habitat, or to a degree a shell that could also collect energy. He did not however think that a full-on Dyson sphere entirely encasing a star was mechanically feasible. Indeed, such a structure depicted in the Star Trek The Next Generation episode relics can only be called virtually impossible to build and probably unnecessary, but virtually means just that and there is one instance where such a thing might be constructed, but other reasons a variant of it might happen more often. Dyson Sphere aside, there are a number of variations of the idea that are much more feasible, and one of them is so feasible that it may be a given for any civilization. The first is the Niven Ring, which is just a ring enclosing a star, often depicted at its equator, as a partial sphere made famous by Larry Niven in his Ring World series. Niven rings are more feasible, and you can have multiple ones in a system as a series of rings arranged around a star, but they are enormous and will still require a lot of time and resources to construct. But you might build one, for reasons I'll get to. Then there is the Dyson Swarm where you have a huge amount of objects that are usually envisioned today to be energy collectors orbiting their star. This has led to an erroneous perception that the only reason you would build a Dyson type megastructure of any type is energy collection, and aliens would likely have hit fusion energy before they had the technology to build a megastructure, making there no reason to build one. The reason that's erroneous was actually showcased by both Dyson and Niven, there are other reasons to build these structures. They didn't present them so much as energy collectors, but again as habitats. In regards to the feasibility of a Dyson Swarm, that one is so feasible we've already done it. In a way, our fleet of active and defunct solar-powered and otherwise spacecraft in solar orbit constitute a very tiny Dyson Swarm. This swarm only grows larger with time and more rocket launches. But the craft that are already there show us why Dyson Swarms would be excellent techno signatures to search for, because those defunct spacecraft will be sitting there for a billion years or more, quietly radiating detectably in infrared. You'd need a lot of them to lead to the infrared excess to be visible to aliens, we aren't there yet, nowhere close, but give us 10 million years and we likely will be, because it still makes more sense to abandon spacecraft and structures in deep space than it is to demolish them. You might eventually do so if you need the materials, but you'd only be doing that in order to build another structure. You'd have to assume that we won't be here in 10 million years doing what we're doing, but we're still here and still launching. That says something. That aspect that an assembly of space structures that grows over time is a key aspect to searching for technosignatures, as a Dyson Swarm is one of the longest lived technosignatures possible. Even if a civilization goes extinct, its dead equipment in space will still be detectable as long as there is enough of it. Very, very long term, meaning that infrared SETI is among the most important, but still only sparsely looked at areas of SETI. Yet in what has been done, a number of candidates have appeared, over 60 of them. They may not turn out to be Dyson spheres and have natural explanations, but that number of candidates is more than any other area of SETI. So we are already in the process of building a Dyson Swarm completely without the intent of generating energy. Of course they do generate energy to run the spacecraft, but the actual use of the spacecraft is typically scientific. So Dyson Swarms do get built without the intent of energy collection in the interests of communications and science. But there's another glaring motivation that may scale the idea of a Dyson Swarm up significantly. Population and land. And that's where the Niven Ring comes in. This issue affects all forms of Dyson ideas and was also first noted by Dyson himself in his original paper. Referring to it as Malthusian pressure, this concept has gotten somewhat of a bad rap in the past. Malthusian ideas have in the past been very doom and gloom, alarmist, and their predictions flatly didn't pan out. This happened to Malthus himself. He had predicted we'd reach peak agriculture rapidly as our population grew, forcing a very deadly Malthusian correction in population. Malthus failed to realize that there was still an enormous amount of land on Earth that was not yet being cultivated, and actually there still is, and that agriculture techniques and technology would continue to improve throughout the 19th century, allowing for better, more efficient farming. 
So his ideas never panned out, nor did the ideas of certain overpopulation books in the 1960s, predicting we'd run out of aluminum in the 1990s, despite aluminum being one of the most common elements in the Earth's crust. But there actually is a limit somewhere, and this is where Malthusian ideas become relevant. Assuming a species remains biological and doesn't upload itself into a cloud as technology advances, there is a number somewhere that limits its population. We might be cooking along right now at 8 billion, but think about a world where the human population grew to 100 trillion. You're going to need more land, and space habitats become as attractive as or even better than colonizing and terraforming other planets. Assuming, however, that populations grow indefinitely, ours may not, and it's anyone's guess what alien population sizes could be, because for them population growth could be much harder than for us, or much, much easier, if they proliferate like rabbits. But with a big population, an actual enclosing Dyson shell in this case becomes more attractive, if virtually impossible, because it would contain an unbelievably enormous amount of area for a civilization to inhabit. A Niven ring? Maybe but it too would be hard. But a Niven ring would do the same. Both, however, suffer from a need for gravity. To get centrifugal force, artificial gravity, you have to spin faster than any envisionable material could handle. So another option is what has been termed a rung world. This is a ring, as Niven envisioned, but in a ladder-like configuration, where the individual rungs spin and create artificial gravity. You may not need to go this far, however, Spinning O'Neill cylinders in space will do the same thing, but without any rigid framework. The ring itself ultimately isn't needed. But it has to be said, if we're locating our population in O'Neill cylinders in the future, these two contribute and help constitute a Dyson Swarm. And you don't need crazy materials to build O'Neill cylinders, you just need materials. For connected, massive structures, no material we have will be strong enough but you can play with ideas of programmable matter, or some far future material that we can't yet create that might be better suited. But those ideas are often very vague, unobtainium, and not well fleshed out. A Dyson swarm of cylinder habitats seems far more practical, but who knows what aliens actually do or do not do. And again, even if everyone is extinct, those cylinders will remain there for a very long time, though there is a potential game changer. It really depends on how many structures and ships, energy collectors, and whatever else you might build in space. If that density becomes high enough, and the whole thing ends up unattended after your extinction event, you face the same problem as we do with satellites in Earth orbit. The potential for Kessler Syndrome. Kessler Syndrome is a cascade effect, where if two objects collide, they spray debris, which then goes on in high enough density situations like low Earth orbit and collide with other objects which creates more debris, which collides, and so on, until you end up with a ruined orbit full of nothing but smithereens. This scales up and can happen to a dense enough Dyson Swarm, meaning that the technosignature basically becomes virtually indistinguishable from a natural debris disk. Back to megastructures and why someone would build them. Land isn't the only potential motivation for building a Dyson structure. It also happens to be the most straightforward and realistic way to move a star. If you're a super civilization and you have some motivation to arrange stars or migrate your own star away from some type of danger, you would need to create a structure known as a Shkadov thruster. This is basically half a shell that directs half of the energy of the star in one direction, creating a thrust effect. Over time, the star moves. Shkadov thrusters might not be common, however, and they suffer from many of the same engineering and mechanical challenges of a full sphere. And the reality of it is that if you can build one, then you can very likely travel interstellar space, and you might as well colonize other suitable stars rather than go through the trouble of moving one. But the idea is in principle possible, so long as you have the right materials to do it, which is very much not guaranteed. Often it's noted, and was noted by Dyson, that to build such a structure, say three meters thick, at a distance around Earth's distance from the sun, you need only the mass of Jupiter. It's not the case that it would require more mass than the entire solar system has, as is often argued, but the real problem is that Jupiter, while massive, is made of the wrong materials. Hydrogen and helium are not going to do it. Unless one has cheap transmutation technology, the available materials are limited in that way. 
But in the case of where you do have enough solid material to build one, there are still other reasons you might build a Dyson Sphere, at least of a sort. And a big one is warfare. Few weapons can be envisioned that can operate at interstellar distances are as utterly devastating as the potentials of a Dyson Sphere. Foreshadowed to an unintentional degree by Star Wars, Dyson Spheres can quite frankly be Death Stars. Known as a Nickel Dyson Beam, this variant would be an almost fully encasing Dyson Sphere but with a hole in it to direct collected energy outward into a Death Star Beam that could be used to basically obliterate the surface of a planet at interstellar scales or rapidly strip its atmosphere. Remember, the sun is producing 174,000 terawatts of continuous energy. Direct that at something in the form of a beam, and it's just beyond comprehension. Do that with a larger, more energetic star, and it gets much, much worse. Here we know that this is not currently happening in the Milky Way as far as we can see, as it would be somewhat obvious. But it does bring out a spooky scenario. If we did see that, it's the worst techno signature you can possibly detect because there really isn't a defense against it. And if you saw it, and then you saw it move to another planet, and then another, you might come to believe that whoever was responsible is sterilizing the galaxy for some reason. And eventually, and without warning, coming at the speed of light, that beam will get to you. Only those on the dark side of a planet would be aware as all communication ceased, but with nothing to stop it would sit there in a waiting game as they rotated around for a certain artificial morning of sorts, heralding utter destruction. Why any species would do that is another question indeed, because it's not likely for clearing planets for colonization purposes, because you're also irreparably damaging the planets you want to settle. You might however do it if you're thinking of the far future, when resources might become scarce, and you want to get rid of your competitors before they get Dyson Sphere technology and look to get rid of you. The early bird gets the worm, so to speak. And that brings us to another motive for constructing a Dyson structure. The most impressive structures on Earth tend to not be practical, rather they are done for reasons other than practicality. Culture and religion come to play here. The Great Pyramids of Giza are not necessary for their functions as tombs. You can build a tomb a lot more easily than building a giant pyramid. They were done simply because that was the position of the pharaoh, and that's what he wanted, and that was that. Likewise with pyramids in Central America. They served as both tombs, oftentimes, but were also active temples. They are the largest ancient structures built in the area at the time, but served no function other than religion. The same in Europe. Up until recently, the largest building in a large city in Europe was the cathedral. Often enormous Gothic stone edifices, built solely for religious reasons and they often have burials in them as well. Some of the most famous people in English history are buried inside Westminster Abbey, such as Isaac Newton and Stephen Hawking. The list goes on. Stonehenge and the other henges served as calendars, but also had religious functions. The Forbidden City in China is an enormous, well, city inside a city, dedicated to the service and residence of an emperor. Fast forward to today. Often the largest single buildings in a major city by footprint are sports stadiums. Those are not new, look at Rome's Colosseum. But if you were an alien and you had no such thing as sports, or yours did not have the economic and social infrastructure ours do, then you never predict anyone would ever build such a thing. The point is, civilizations, at least human ones, often create enormous projects for reasons that would not be readily evident unless you knew the culture. And we did that across the world, in ancient and medieval societies. As a result, there may be aliens out there building megastructures not for utility, but cultural use. Emperor Glorkhan, the formerly magnificent, wished to be buried in an event ring. So be it. Or entire civilizations consisting of trillions of members have a cultural tradition of space burials. Bury enough deceased members of that civilization in a star system, and the infrared glow crosses a threshold and becomes evident from a distance. And again, the longevity is what really sets this apart from transient radio signals in SETI. And it has to be said, Earth has had its sun gods in many different cultures. Maybe worshipping your star is a common theme among many civilizations. And a Dyson Sphere would certainly make a nice temple home of a god. As far as longevity, a nice example here is Elon Musk's Tesla, probably the oddest thing we've ever launched into space. 
At this point, it's probably not looking so hot if we went out and took a look. Some of its materials just aren't going to last, getting blasted by the full fury of the sun's radiation. The tires, leather interior, and the paint are probably already long gone. The carbon fiber will last longer, but not that much longer. The glass will get degraded and broken by micrometeoroids, but the metal frame and other parts will be out there indefinitely, so long as it doesn't impact Earth or Venus. But so far, all of this has been based on a single assumption, that the species chooses to remain biological and have the motivations of biological intelligence. There is, of course, another option that is far less predictable, that they either become machines and upload themselves, or create a machine that becomes its own civilization, like the Geth and Reapers from Mass Effect. If they upload, they may retain their motivations and remain themselves, but a machine created by biology may have motivations far different than biological aliens. One of these is computation. It may want to maximize that, which has led to the concept of a matryoshka brain, which is a full-on shell that collects the starlight that's nested inside another shell that collects the first shell's waste heat, and another outside that, and so on, until all that's left is low-energy, far-infrared that's not worth collecting with a further structure. Waste heat is just a thermodynamic reality of the universe. There's no getting past it. But a machine might be motivated to collect that much energy for use in maximized computation. But it also might not do that if it concludes at some point that there is no point to expanding its capabilities, and it may stop with simply a handful of fusion reactors. So in the end, yes, some Dyson structures are feasible, and in the case of a Dyson Swarm, a likely enough outcome that it's worth looking for as an alien technosignature, and if we last long enough, it will become the most obvious technosignature that this star system has a civilization. If that swarm is dense enough, it will be visible, and if it grows, showing increasing infrared radiation, then you can surmise that the civilization building it was still active when the light left the system. Likewise, if it's dense enough, and you actually can see the structures in the light curve of the star, then they haven't gone Kessler, and would also suggest active maintenance. But hidden within all of this is a rather disturbing reality. Setting candidates aside that will probably end up being natural, we're still left with a deafening great silence in the Milky Way. If it turns out that as far as we can tell, we're the only civilization in the galaxy actively working towards a Dyson Swarm, might lead us to conclude that for some reason alien civilizations are rare, or never extensive enough to build the density needed to see them. But there's another option. Somewhere out there, just maybe, there is an inactive nickel Dyson sphere. And the reason we see no one out there is because the Milky Way has recently been sterilized. A spooky solution to the Fermi Paradox, indeed. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently wondering about another solution to Fermi. That aliens work on much slower timescales than we do and there just hasn't been enough time for them or anyone else to build megastructures. In which case, the first SETI message we might receive in Decipher just says, don't be hasty. Not sure how I would feel about that. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.